We could use your help keeping the Omaha History Podcast going. Please consider becoming a patron for as little as a dollar a month. Go to patreon.com slash Omaha. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. It'll help pay the light bill. Welcome to the North Omaha History Podcast with noted author and historian Adam Fletcher Sassy. Each week, Adam takes you on a guided tour through Omaha's dynamic past. In the last decade, the lynching of Will Brown has received a lot of attention in Omaha and beyond. However, many of the facts in the story have been lost to time and others muddled away. For years, Adam has searched for little-known details about Brown's lynching. So, Adam, what did you discover? Steve, let's begin with the image of a dark night covering Omaha. It's two days after the lynching of Will Brown, and the streets of Omaha are strangely silent. There are marching in sync in unison, fresh from World War I. There are U.S. Army soldiers parading up and down the streets of North Omaha specifically, around Cumming, North 16th, North 24th, all the way up to Lake. Imagine in that same dark black sky, a hot air balloon floating, peering around, shining a light down into the neighborhood below them. This was the scene in North Omaha two nights after the lynching of Will Brown. The lynching of Will Brown happened after a long summer in America. It was called the Red Summer across the United States because of the pools of red blood of African Americans that were flowing freely through the streets in dozens of cities. Omaha thought it had escaped this terror, Steve. They thought they had gotten away with it. The mayor of Omaha was a guy named Ed Smith, and he was a little bit cautious to really proclaim safety, but all the same, he was happy that there wasn't big rioting and big lynching that was going on in his city all summer long as it had in cities across the country. But that September, on the night of September 26, a white woman in South Omaha, her name was Agnes Lobeck. Agnes ran to her house and screamed in the front door. She had a date with her. And uh, she ran through the front door and screamed that she had been assaulted by a black man. And she made it sound as hellacious and terrible as she possibly could. It, it was it was September 26th, and uh, she was out on a date with a guy named Milton Hoffman. Now, Agnes went into her house, screamed this thing. But the interesting thing right away was that that wasn't the first time that summer that that had happened in Omaha, Steve. Instead, it was at least the sixth time that a young white woman had claimed that an African-American had assaulted her on the street when she was walking along innocently. The difference, supposedly, is that this time, Milton Hoffman was with her. Milton, her date, was uh, slightly disabled and had been known to be a thuggish guy. And he had taken her on a date, and they were walking on Scenic Avenue in the little neighborhood of Gibson there in South Omaha when uh, this attack supposedly happened. The next day, the Omaha Bee printed a headline. So the police came and investigated, and the newspapers were on it, and the Omaha Bee printed this headline that said, The most daring attack on a white woman ever perpetuated in Omaha, the most recent act of a series of violent offenses conducted by the, quote, Negro on Caucasian females in the city. It was it was just plain sensationalism, Steve. They went on to say that pretty little Agnes Lobeck was assaulted by a Negro. She identified as William Brown while returning home in company with Milton Hoffman, her fiancé, a cripple and decorated war veteran. This was the era right after the soldiers had returned from World War I, and they came back to Omaha to find some of their jobs were taken by African Americans who had migrated from the South. Trying to escape the economic deprivation and plain white supremacy there, they had come to Omaha in the previous decade in historic numbers. African Americans populated Omaha and made it a rich place to live, made it fantastic, especially the near north side where they were segregated to live. 
there were black owned businesses, there were black owned enterprises, African Americans were building houses and churches in record numbers, and they were migrating to the city all over the place. Newspapers like the Monitor were growing and booming and really promoting the whole entire city's well-being, as well as African Americans in particular. Uh, the NAACP had started uh, to call for more rights for African Americans because they had already sensed that Omaha was a bit against the tide in turning towards the freedom and justice for all people. Well, freedom and justice had nothing to do with what happened in September 1919. There was a sweep that happened immediately after Agnes Lobeck reported her assault, a sweep of African-American men led by the Omaha Police Department, where they hustled together 40 black men and brought them to the jail downtown. All of them were released as soon as they were found to have uh, reliable alibis, though. However, at one point, Will Brown was swept up inside of the mayhem. He was brought directly to Agnes Lobeck's house where she said, that's him, that's the man who did it. And he was brought to jail. Almost immediately, there was a group of men outside of the Omaha jail, which at that point was on the top floor of the Douglas County Courthouse that we know exists today. It was built in 1911, finished in 1911. And by 1919, it was just eight years old. Regardless, Will Brown was brought there, and a crowd started gathering outside almost immediately. Twenty boys at first. They were all reputed to be teenage boys. Milton Hoffman led a crowd, Steve. He gathered together a crowd in South Omaha and marched them up 13th Street all the way to downtown, all the way up Arnie, all the way to the Douglas County Courthouse. Another guy from way up north in Florence, this guy... He put together a crowd, and he marched them down from Florence. They rode the streetcars. This crowd converged outside the Douglas County Courthouse within hours of Will Brown being arrested. And the crowd grew from 20 to 200, from 200 to 2,000. Steve, by nighttime, there were more than 10,000 people gathered outside of the courthouse. And they started throwing rocks at the building. And they started calling for the, the black man to be brought out so that the crowd could serve justice. Interesting thing happened that evening when a lawyer for the NAACP, a man named Pinkett, Harrison Pinkett, went to interview Will Brown inside of his jail room, his his cell. And in his interview, Pinkett made a note. Will Brown was too crippled to have assaulted anybody. Apparently the man had severe rheumatoid arthritis, and was hunched over and had a crinkled hands and couldn't literally couldn't grasp onto anything. Well, Pinkett made his note and he went to uh, the police to get Will Brown freed, but it didn't work. They didn't set him free. Instead, they tightened down the courthouse. And by 8 or 9 p.m. that night, the Omaha police chief said, you know what, everything's good here. Let's let the extra cops go home and the rest of us can just take care of stuff. So they let the extra cops go home. Within a few more hours, the crowd swelled even further, up to 20,000 people, Steve. The cops came back, but it was too late. The crowd was getting out of hand. The mayor of the city, Ed Smith himself, he was a reformist mayor, you know. He was a guy who wanted to make change in Omaha, make it a safer, cleaner, better place. He was pro-prohibition, anti-alcohol, anti drugs drugs, anti-guns on the streets. He was no friend of Tom Dennison, who I will talk about extensively in just a minute. But all the same, Ed Smith came out on the steps and he claimed, proclaimed to the crowd that justice will be served. Don't worry about this man. Everything will be okay. And within minutes of him finishing his speech, the crowd welled up and went over the top of him, literally putting a rope around his neck. They put a rope around his neck and they dragged him out to a streetcar line. And you know what they tried to do to Mayor Ed Smith? Steve, they tried to hang the man, lynch him right then and there, and they pulled him up in the air. And suddenly a car burst through the crowd. Now, it's not exactly agreed on who exactly jumped out of the car to cut down the mayor. But all the same, somebody cut the rope. And Ed Smith was freed. But he was never the same again. He was brought to a hospital and spent a couple days recuperating there before... He went to uh, Missouri to really get better. 
And even when he got better, he died a young man. And it was said that it was the stress of what happened to him during that lynching that night that killed him. Anyway, that was the mayor. Imagine what they did to Will Brown. And whatever you imagine, imagine a little bit more because it's not enough. They did him wrong. Almost immediately, this, uh, this mob, this horde of people starts howling, literally howling. They raided the courthouse. They sent up notes that said to the jailers, if you send down the black man, we'll let you live. If you don't, we will kill every prisoner and every man inside this building. There were a hundred other prisoners there. Eventually, the horde handed over Will Brown. And Will Brown was brought outside of the Douglas County Courthouse where they tortured him. Steve, they poked and prodded and cut and punched and hit and kicked and did every vile and disgusting thing to a live man that you could. They dismembered him while he was still alive. Eventually, they threw him on a fire. You see, they had set the courthouse on fire. This mob did and caused hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage. But that wasn't enough for the hungry, angry white mob that was determined to lynch a black man that night. Instead, they threw his body, probably before he was dead, onto a funeral pyre, a fire. There's a horrific photo that floats around the Internet showing the corpse of Will Brown burning by this mob of 20,000 white Omahans. Then they tied a rope around his body and they dragged around downtown Omaha and up Dodge Street. What a hellacious night. That September night. That 27th of September in 1919. The mob kept going after Will Brown. Not a lot of people talk about this, Steve, but it's important to note that the mob kept going. That's right, this white mob of 20,000 people, it started to peter out a little bit, but the police couldn't control them anymore. Nothing could stop them. So the mob turned north. It walked up to Cumming Street from the courthouse from Douglas, walked up to Cumming Street and looked for the black neighborhood and found it. They demolished 10 homes that night. They wounded 20 policemen. They murdered at least one other African-American who was just walking on the streets and caught by the mob. The damage that they did to the courthouse took more than five years to rebuild. Among other things, they destroyed the assessor's office. They smashed windows. It, it was horrible. In the meantime, Omaha's black neighborhood didn't stand for this. This was not an easy thing. They got guns as well. They went and collected guns from stores up and down 24th Street and handed them out freely to blacks who were said to number 10,000 African Americans hiding on rooftops and in hiding spots throughout the near north side. When this white mob got to 24th and coming, they were met by a group of U.S. Army soldiers. These soldiers had been called from... Uh, Missouri and Iowa and Fort Omaha to that neighborhood to protect the blacks, supposedly. They set up three different camps around Omaha. More than 300 U.S. Army soldiers were garrisoned at 24th and Lake. They had Gatling guns prepared to fire and destroy the white mob as it came north. 20,000 people in this white mob infiltrating the black neighborhood. African Americans armed to the teeth as much as they could find with rifles, and the U.S. Army standing guard. The Army set up patrols, declared martial law, and uh, this, this observation balloon was launched from Fort Omaha. It was stationed over at 30th and Bedford. There was a field there at that point. And that observation balloon, that's the one that I mentioned at the beginning. You know, to really make the boundaries clear, uh, the U.S. Army, they set up a map and they drew a line around the African-American neighborhood that was roughly from coming to Lake Street from north 16th to about north 30th. And uh, they were protecting, quote, protecting the neighborhood. They said to blacks, if you stay inside this red line, we can protect you. If you go outside of it, you're on your own. Martial law lasted for four or five days in Omaha. 
before the U.S. Army, before General Wood himself pulled out and left town. You know, Wood went on to run for uh, U.S. president, this general who, quote, protected the African-American neighborhood in Omaha during those riots. And uh, he went on to run for president. It was a little bit suspicious when he uh, switched his reasoning for why the Omaha riots happened. He originally said that it was because of white fanaticism and uh, the Red Summer, and it was part of the national trend. And later on, when he was running for president, he said it was the Bolsheviks who did it. The Red Summer was caused by the Bolsheviks. Omaha had some anarchists who lived in South Omaha and were active around the city and would believe that it was them, the anarchists, the Bolsheviks, who really led this movement. But he was wrong. He was wrong, and there has been research that have proven otherwise uh, that I'll explain in just a second. But first, let's talk about what happened after the riots. Ten days later, October 8th, 1919, 120 indictments were handed down by a grand jury investigating the riot. There were confessions, there were witnesses, there were interrogations that lasted for weeks in the court. However, only two men were ever charged with a crime. One of them was that white guy from Florence. His name was Claude Nethaway. Claude Nethaway was a notoriously racist real estate agent who openly printed on his business card that he does not sell property to the N-word, the S-word, and other ethnicities who are black and brown. He was openly racist. He was charged with uh, the crime of murdering Will Brown and inciting a riot, along with another man named George Davis. Both of them were later found not guilty. They were released. Nobody ever served time. Nobody was ever convicted of a crime for the murdering and lynching of Will Brown and for the lynching of Mayor Smith. Now, the grand jury did find the police captain innocent of making the situation worse, and they congratulated the mayor for his heroics. But they found the police department guilty for exacerbating the riot and uh, neglecting to staff the courthouse the right way. It was bad stuff. Lots of things went on. Will Brown himself was buried in the Potter's Field. You know, the Potter's Field is a section of Forest Lawn Cemetery. And uh, Will Brown's body was thrown into a hole and covered up, and there was no funeral. There was no grave marker. And nobody sung the blues about Will Brown. And instead, for almost 90 years, the story just disappeared. Well, it disappeared for some people. You know, if you happen to be white and could forget about it, I doubt that Agnes Loback herself could ever forget about it. She ended up marrying Milton Hoffman. Hoffman disappeared from Omaha and was never found or tried for any crime, even though he incited the riot and had a lot of role in it. But he did marry Agnes, and they had several children. And uh, a lot of these offspring actually still live in Omaha. When she died in 1966, Agnes lived in South Omaha. Milton went on to remarry and died in 82. They're both buried at uh, West Lawn Hillcrest for Funeral Home and Memorial Park today. In, uh, in 2009, a Californian named Chris Herbert heard about the lynching of Will Brown. And he donated a uh, headstone to the Potter's Field, to Forest Lawn, to mark the gravesite. That was in 2009. Since then, commemoration has gone up. People are starting to remember. This year, this September, marks the horrific anniversary of the lynching of Will Brown. And there will be commemorative events through Omaha. But none of them will be complete unless they mention one man who I've neglected to say his name so far, except for once. And that was none other than Omaha's political boss, Tom Dennison. Tom Dennison. Tom Dennison, the old gray wolf. Tom Dennison controlled the crime in Omaha. He controlled the opium dens and the heroin dens and the prostitution and the cribs downtown and the gambling joints and all of this sin and vice all the way through uh, the era of alcohol being illegal. He controlled the alcohol flow into Omaha. Tom Dennison was an important man. He was so important that he was able to manipulate a riot. That's right. He's been found to have been the head of the riot. 
that happened in Omaha in 1919. There was a, uh, there's a historian named Orville Menard who wrote a definitive book uh, called River City Empire, Tom Dennison's Omaha, and Menard talks about this extensively. The book suggests that Tom Dennison himself orchestrated men in blackface to commit the crime. Angry mobs that showed up at the Lobeck family home to get Brown, they came because Dennison brought them on. A horse rider came and called for the lynching. That was orchestrated by Tom Dennison. Milton's call, Milton Hoffman's call for vengeance and putting together his own riot crew that was orchestrated by Tom Dennison. See, Tom Dennison, he was mad because Omaha had elected Mayor Ed Smith, a reformist. They'd elected him to office and defeated Dennison's own candidate. So Dennison got back at the city. That's right. He put together the mob of 20,000. And under the guise of the Red Summer, Dennison stoked Omaha's white supremacy with these startling headlines in the Omaha Bee, which he was kind of in cahoots with. Anyway, Dennison made it happen. Of course, he was never found guilty. He was never even charged. People knew almost instantaneously that he was behind it. The, the lawyer for the NAACP, who I mentioned earlier, Pinkett, Pinkett proclaimed it in a newspaper. From his office, Dennison controlled the machinations of the entire mob and made it all happen. Even if there are commemorative events in Omaha happening today, nobody talks about where they happened. Nobody talks about the people who were involved. But I'll tell you, in my research, I found more than 30 distinct people. There was a judge, William Reddick, uh, who found all these folks able to walk away. There was a separate guy named Louis Weaver who uh, became uh, sentenced related to his actions, but not because of the riot itself. Anyway, this guy got 20 years in the slammer in Lincoln for it. Marshall Eberstein was a police chief. He was assaulted by the crowd when he talked to them. He was found not guilty by the grand jury, but uh, all the same. William Francis was a 16-year-old cousin of Agnes Lobeck. He was the one hired by Dennison to ride the horse and the mob to incite the crowds to attack the courthouse. Anyway, the list goes on. I put it all on Omaha, NorthOmahaHistory.com, and it's a big, fat list filled with names. But the other thing that I've done, Steve, is created a list of locations involved in the lynching of Brown. And I've got 12 places here, and there are a lot more that I'm going to end up getting on there. But it's places like the Lobeck family home where Agnes ran home to. It's uh, Milton Hoffman's house where he left with Agnes to escort her home. It was the location of the attack. It was the location of Denison's offices. Bancroft School, where a big mob of 300 people gathered to march to the courthouse. The courthouse itself. The intersection where Will Brown was lynched. The intersection where Will Brown was burnt. The city auditorium where the U.S. Army took up headquarters. 24th and Lake, where the major field station was. Potter's Cemetery. So many places through Omaha are tainted and stained with the blood of Will Brown. Now, a not ironic thing is that 50 years after the lynching of Will Brown, there was a young woman who was shot in the summertime by an Omaha policeman. Her name was Vivian Strong. Her end of The anniversary of her murder is this year as well. 20 years before Will Brown... There was a guy named George Smith who was lynched in Omaha, an African-American who was lynched because of his race. So this is a pattern, Steve. This is part of a larger thing that goes on and continues. And this injustice is felt all around the city. From my historian's point of view, the thing that I'm missing the most is recognition. Recognition from the city of Omaha that, you know what, there needs to be historical markers. There needs to be plaques and remembrance ceremonies to keep in mind that Omaha did this thing And it has the propensity to do it again if it's not careful. We all know history repeats itself, especially when it's forgotten. Let's remember the death of Will Brown in this horrific incident in Omaha history and understand that it's part of a larger system that continues still today. And that's a history of the lynching of Will Brown. 
Thanks for listening to the North Omaha History Podcast with noted author and historian Adam Fletcher Sassy. Join us next week as Adam takes you on another guided tour through Omaha's dynamic past.